welcome to Comrades and Farms here on Truth Frequency Radio, iHeart, tuned in and talk stream live. And we have a very special guest tonight, Ian Stepler. Uh, I'm going to go and try and... Oh, no. YouTube went down. <laughs> All right, I guess we're going to carry this interview on on TFR right off the bat. Uh, so let me just connect into Ian Stepler quickly. I guess Skype to cooperate. Um... So anyway, uh, as I was saying, uh, Ian Stepler is a Canadian, is a commercial Canadian beekeeper in Canada, and uh, Ian has his own YouTube channel, a Canadian Beekeepers Blog, and uh, he speaks at various different seminars and stuff, and he's just a wealth of information on honeybees. So, uh, Ian, uh, I'd love to hear uh, more about your overwintering operation, and uh, I also want to say I'm really honored to have you come on the show. This is like a Christmas gift for me, so so thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thanks, Carlton. I'm more than happy to be here with you tonight. Sorry. Sorry, my audio is breaking up over here, so. <laughs> I'm not sure why that is, but uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you good, yeah. Okay, good. And I and I have you back now, so hopefully we're okay. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if maybe you could just describe uh, briefly for people uh, your, you know, how you how you go about overwintering your bees. I know this is uh, not something that's normally done, but I know it is done in certain areas on commercial level. It's a really interesting method of doing uh, the overwintering here in New York. We just uh, leave them out. We try to insulate them as much as we can give them some ventilation so we don't have uh, too much moisture and that's about all we can do but you have a, a little bit more controlled method of doing that yeah we uh, focus onto our wintering uh, very specifically um, as wintering indoors and basically one of the reasons is basically what's going on right now outside I just walked down to the honey house here, and we're experiencing a massive blizzard that's coming through right now. We have, we're getting a foot of snow dropped onto us, and what's it, uh, uh, like 80 click winds out there tonight. It's just crazy. Minus 17 uh, with a wind chill, so that's like minus 30 or something like that. It's pretty, it's miserable. So, you know, it's this kind of cold, windy, harsh weather is what we want to protect our hives from. So what we do is we, we, we remove them from the outside elements and we bring them inside into a cold storage and uh, just to, you know, relieve them of all the stress from all that weather. It's basically what we do. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah, I know, I know you've talked in some of your videos about how you, you try to maintain an optimal temperature. And I know you've talked about how that has to do with like uh, keeping a cluster in a certain state and how that's a little bit more efficient on um, on honey usage. Could you like elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. Uh, so we try to maintain a four degrees uh, Celsius temperature within the sh shed, and that just focuses on you know, what, what what we're trying to do. Like in New York, um, what what would you say? Where about in New York are you from, anyways, uh, Carlton? Uh, I'm from Tivoli. We're about ninety miles north of New York City. Uh, not too far from the Massachusetts border. So we're quite a ways uh, south of the Canadian border here. Oh, yeah. So what uh, what kind of winter would you be experiencing down there as in cold? Like, uh, were you looking at, like, uh, uh, minus 10s or minus 15s through the winter? Or what yeah, do you typically, it, typically get down there? Yeah, in Celsius, yeah, it would be in the minus 10, minus 15 range. Uh, it can get uh, it can get as cold as minus 20 or even 25, but that's more rare. It's usually more, in okay. the, you know, freezing, uh, you know, a little above freezing in the daytime and, uh, you know, significantly below, but not super low at night, although we do have cold oh, snaps yeah. that come through. And you guys are going to be pretty humid, too, where you are, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, very humid. Uh, in fact, uh, we've had some rainy winters the last uh, couple of years on and off. And, uh, and even when we get snow, uh, often it's it's a wetter snow. We just got a, about a two-foot snowstorm back last week. 
but uh, that was a, a rare exception. It was pretty cold, and it was much drier and powderier. But now things have warmed up, and it's it's pretty humid and damp. And I mean, it's 36 Fahrenheit out right now, but you go out there, and it actually feels colder than one of those colder, drier days. Yeah. So, you know, your type of weather would not suit indoor winter at all, because what what happens in Manitoba here is when uh, winter comes down, it like it falls like a like an axe, just boom! All of a sudden, we're into winter, and we're we're windy, and we're and there's snow. And you, when you have winter hives inside, you have to like you're trying to maintain a very specific condition for them, and you're trying to maintain consistency is what you're trying to do. So you move them inside, you turn off the lights. And you, in a sense, the bees don't go dormant, but in a sense, you, you want them to kind of drift into kind of like a, a dormancy state, like kind of a restless state. So the way we do that is we, we keep the temperature at a specific temperature, and that's at four degrees. And we find that four degree mark is probably that magic number of where bees winter most efficiently on, uh, on their food. So, so they're not clustered up so tight that they can't move around and access the rest of their food. But they're not so loose and active that they're consuming, you know, wasteful consuming. So we find that four degrees is that magic number. If you get, you mean, we could get down to one degree or even minus four or whatever, but then you run into condensation issues within the shed. Um, and the way we maintain that temperature, like every one of these colonies um, uh, kicks off, what is it, like 15 or 20 watts of heat energy. So you got to imagine inside of a shed of, 1,000, 1,500 hives, they're kicking off 25 to 30,000 watts of heat energy you've got to remove from that shed. So the way we do that is uh, with cycling through the cold air that we have, like our natural cold winter air, like what you're experiencing right now. So you pull that cold air from the outside, and, you pull, and then it, you pull out the warm, humid air from in the shed to maintain that consistent temperature. Um, when you get temperature fluctuations outside, it doesn't help uh, because it, it, it's harder to maintain that consistency within the shed, a consistent temperature. Because what you want to do, and I'm kind of rambling here a little bit, what, what you want to do is you, you want to put that hive into winter. You want them to hold that cluster at four degrees and just kind of have them sit there so they're not expanding and contracting all the time. You, you want them to stop moving. You want them to kind of, you know, we will turn down the fans within the shed and just um, allow that hive to, I'm a believer in the carbon dioxide envelope where it, the bees will actually you know, form that nest and slow down and just kind of drift into a trance almost and get them through like five, 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 five and a half months of winter. And you know, you're saying that you're in New York, it's kind of humid. And in the prairies in Manitoba here, it's extremely dry and that's typically because it's so bloody cold so when that cold dry air comes into the shed it mixes with that warm humid air within the shed and ex you can expel all that moisture so actually we don't have any trouble maintaining uh, low humidities within that shed uh, just because of the reason that cold air right humid i know i talked to some guys down in florida and try to do it with refrigeration and such and they're always having trouble with humidity because of that humid air they're bringing in all the time and and then they get humidity levels too high, and they start having mold issues. So, you know, in the roundabout way, we're we're targeting very specific conditions, and we're using that weather that we're trying to get our hives out of, and we're using that weather to help maintain those conditions within the shed. So it works really well. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. You're basically taking something that's usually a detriment and making it an asset. I like that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, comment on how much I appreciate the cold of winter up in Manitoba, but in certain circumstances, when you're trying to manage other conditions with it, then it comes in handy. <laughs> so yeah. we use the cold and the dry to our, our advantage, uh, just helping us being able to maintain the shed conditions. I'm not set up with any type of refrigeration or, you know, I'd have to spend all that money uh, investment into that just because we're so reliant. We're, we have this very reliable cold winter that we use. But actually, this winter has been very mild through the had kind of mild weather coming through, and it's been harder 
holding that temperature down in the shed. And I've noticed the bees are maybe a little more active than they should. I'm concerned a little bit on food consumption. But now this bloody cold weather is falling through again. Looks like it's going to be cold for the rest, as far as else we can see. So I think it's going to be able to maintain that shed just perfectly now. Very good, very good. That's interesting. I wasn't aware that uh, some some of the more southern states had tried refrigeration with that, but that makes a lot of sense with the humidity thing. You almost have to be able to like circulate, cool, and dehumidify that air at a pretty phenomenal rate when you think about all the respiration of all those bees in there, huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how they're able to do it. I know there's a big producers down in, in Idaho that use these big potato cellars. And which are set up with refrigeration and such just because of the potato cold storage. And they do a really, they, they don't winter as long as we do up here. Like we put our hives in in November, we don't bring them out till April. So we're looking at a long winter. And those, those guys, they put them in, you know, November, October, November, and they, they're taking them out in January to take them to, to the almonds <clears throat> in California. So they don't have to experience such a long winter. But they're trying to achieve some of the main th things that we are up here is they're trying to achieve that natural shutdown, you know, trying to just park your bees somewhere where they can shut them down, not have to pour all this food into them or, you know, some of the guys, I know some, I had a guy in California actually that built a shed and it's refrigerated and his idea is to not only shut them down uh, to conserve on a uh, food resource, but also to shut them down to be able to treat for mite it's because in the hive goes broodless, uh, and they can treat with mites when they come out of the shed and target those little guys uh, uh, very effectively. And it's hard for those guys because they're always brooding otherwise if they're outside. And down in Florida, guys are having mixed results it's down there for a lot of talking, and I'm not sure what the circumstances around that, but they're having a lot of trouble with humidity, and it's just trying to keep the humidity down in the shed. But there, some guys are having pretty high losses. You gotta when you winter well when you winter bees at any at anyway, especially wintering indoors, you, you have to have very low mite counts. And I think it's just something natural about the shutdown period of the bees and just the you know, that extended life. Uh, the, the mites really throw a wrench into the whole process. Very interesting. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that uh, managing that might process a little bit. I know I've heard a lot of different beekeepers with a lot of different perspectives and stuff, but I mean, you're up there doing it successful on a large scale, uh, on an impressively large scale. So I, I would love to hear a little more on your insight on that. Yeah, so we uh, so you have to appreciate that in Manitoba, Canada, um, we're in the prairies and our seasons are very uh, how do I explain it they're very specific they're very deliberate you know there's a there's a, a deliberate uh, winter spring summer and fall like we have four seasons and the bees they react just absolutely exactly precisely to those seasons so, you know it comes through winter they're in their winter mode comes spring it's like an axe drop. So those bees are in spring mode. They start building in the way they go. And then summer, we've got all this resource coming in. It's just, you know, it changed from a swarming period into a summer hoarding period. And then, boom, they're preparing for winter just like that. Because something, there's cues that they, they recognize um, and they react to. So we have to appreciate that we're very, we have very four distinct seasons. And we take advantage of that as beekeepers up here by just being able to uh, manipulate our hives around those seasons very effectively. So, you know, I guess we could start in winter where the hive is, I've, I used to argue it was absolutely broodless because you take your hive out of winter and you didn't see any brood, but you didn't see the typical brood. There is a little bit of brood, a little bit of winter brood always going on, just a very small amount. But for the most part, a winter nest coming out is broodless. Um and they, they go into spring, and she starts to lay, and she lays crazy in the spring, and she uh, flips over that winter nest into that reproductive nest. And right about that time, we take one out of the shed, we drop some apple bar into them, you know, use a very reliable uh, chemical treatment to kill off those mites. Um, so we do that in the early spring right out of the shed through April, and I get them into May, and before we start splitting them, 
and all the treatments done. So pretty much the mites are cleaned up. Uh, and then we're making splits, and then we're boxing them up for the honey flow and such. So there's no treatments or anything to be considered all through summer as we're collecting the honey. But once we take the honey boxes off, we start monitoring again, just to just to you know kind of observe to see whether or not there's any mites that built out through the summer. And if there is, we use another chemical treatment to knock them down just because there's a lot of brood present in these colonies. So we have to use kind of like an extended period. But what I've been finding that as I've adopted the oxalic acid vapor treatment uh, late in the season, like I'm talking before we put them back into the shed, uh, end of October, right when that hive naturally goes broodless again, we, we treat them with the oxalic acid treatment. And that seems that uh, the combination of the apivar in the spring, where we're, uh, we're cleaning up the main, main issue, that seems to be able to extend us through that fall period where we maybe were treating otherwise. Gets us to late season, end of eight, uh, August, end of October, where there's no brood. We hit them with oxalic acid. It kills whatever's left in there for mites. And, and we repeat the cycle again. And uh, it's, I'm not sure, ever since I've been doing that, I've been experiencing extreme effectiveness with my Apivar treatment. Uh, um, uh, because I just think it's helping relieve maybe some type of uh, resistant issues. If there is any, if the if there is any mites that aren't killed in the spring because of resistance or tolerance to that amitraz, the, uh, the oxalic acid might be cleaning them up later in the fall and just allowing that treatment to be more effective the next spring if there's any there. And you'll be asking, so why the hell do you treat again in the next, next spring with apivart <laughs> if you got them all cleaned up in the uh, but last fall, why do you treat them again in the spring? The reason I do that is I have to. Uh, just uh, re residual mites in the area from neighbors around as they drift into your colonies, you just a uh, natural influx of mites. You have to be able to control that uh, through those periods where there's a lot of robin pressure. So that's that's why I use that apple bar, my main treatment, and then and then I use my oxalic acid weight in the uh, the fall. I, I do find that in um, after the honey flow, after we pull our boxes off as our hives uh, drift into fall, that I, I am seeing influx of mites from my neighbors around. So I have to watch. Sometimes I have to go and treat out the bar in those colonies or close neighbors, which maybe are having trouble for some reason with their mites. It's infesting my colony. So I have to be very vigilant on the monitor and make sure I catch that if it happens. But for the most part, my apiary is pretty intact here. I've got 200 square miles just to myself. So we farm a lot of the ranch, and we, our neighbors have been here for quite a while. So I've been able to establish a territory, so I've been able to keep my neighbors away. <clears throat> and it just kind of helps me maintain my mite issues within my, my apiary. So that works very well. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm... I, uh, I wouldn't have thought that you'd have so much drift uh, pressure coming in, but I guess that makes a lot of sense there. Honeybees seem to be more interactive than uh, at least and I've recognized them for uh, in the past. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff I hadn't considered before I started keeping bees, and I've learned a tremendous amount. And I know uh, you were talking about this fall. I think you had some really strange weather, and you hadn't even gotten oxalic acid on some of your hives before you were uh, trying to pull them into the shed. And then you got a warm spell, I think, and you were able to pull them back out and finish it up, right? Yeah, yeah we had – this is, you know, what's usual for weather, right? <laughs> weather is always unusual, so it's – it's just a matter of not, you know, we say, oh, you know, this isn't typical, like, bullshit, it's not typical, it's just weather. <laughs> it's just how it is, right? So, um, this awesome. fall was a lot better than last fall. Last fall, fall was a real asshole, but this fall was kind of easy in a way because it was, it was dry and it was steady and allowed us to get our work. Uh, we, we run off a hot, dry summer, uh, but October turned really cold on us, like, extremely cold. So I actually, <clears throat> we only had half our apiary treated with oxalic acid before we started bringing them in. I was like, oh shit, I missed my chance to treat these mites. And I, I couldn't treat any sooner because there was too much brood still in these colonies. Like when you treat oxalic acid for, with uh, high with brood inside, especially late season brood, I mean, you're going to be missing a lot of those mites because they're going to be underneath the, the cappings of the brood. 
So, you know, I brought half my apron in because I already pulled the pin. I said, okay, winter's here. And you want to get caught by a foot and a half of snow. And then we had like 20 degree weather come through, 18 degree, 20 degree. We had almost a week of this beautiful weather come through. And I actually had to start, I pulled my ape, the 800 highs right ever I had inside. I had to pull them out, just dropped them in the yard. And uh, that allowed us to get around uh, to the ones, to the yards that we hadn't treated yet. And it gave them a good shot of the oxalic. So it, it worked out all right. It was actually kind of nice. I'm, I'm not complaining at all about that weather. It's just, you know, we just got to manage it. But that mild spill that come through cost me a lot of work because I already started moving hives in and I had to move them all back out. But, I, you know, there's some guys that kept their hives inside <clears throat> through that mild weather. And I think it was a mistake because that uh, mild weather come through, those bees got out. They hadn't been flying all October. And that last cleansing flight is extremely important for those bees, especially, you know, they got a five and a half months of winter in travel. My idea was to get them out. They're flying. They're fly- flying almost like it was April um, in the spring. It was almost like springtime flight. They, they've been confined for a month. And it, there was, like, there was, that, there was that springtime shit storm that always happens. It's, it was like, holy shit, like, am I in the right season right now? <laughs> but I got them out. They flew, they relieved themselves, and uh, moved them back in, and they are extremely content. So I think I made the right choice there. Awesome. Yeah, I know the uh, that cleaning flight thing is amazing in the spring here when I see it, but I, I, uh, I, I wasn't really aware of that either before I started keeping bees, but like it makes a lot of sense. Like It's basically like uh, having to not go to the bathroom for several months and, and uh, how you would feel in that position. But um, uh, maybe when we come back, we got about two minutes left before the break, but uh, maybe when we come back, we could talk a little bit about the Nozema. And I know you were talking about, you put up a video uh, back in the fall, I think, about uh, sunflowers and sunflower pollen help. Uh, at least there's a study out that, that suggests that it helps reduce the Nozema load. And uh, I'd love to yes. go into a little more detail about that when we come back from the break. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we got about a minute before the break. Do you want to maybe plug your YouTube channel or any other uh, platforms? Or oh. uh... <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I guess I've been doing this YouTube thing for the last two and a half years, I guess it is now. And I've been doing it for a lot of reasons, and it's been attracting a little bit of attention. So it's kind of cool. I've, it's a Canadian beekeeper's blog. And, uh, you know, I just carry a camera in my pocket anytime I'm inspired to say anything. I just kind of hold the camera up in the air and kind of do a selfie shot video of myself. It just thought that's within the VR, kind of like that uh, raw, on the spot, behind the scenes, kind of looking at commercial operations. So that's that's basically my whole... There's not a lot of production value. <laughs> You'll notice I, I'm not very flashy or classy. But <laughs> I, I have to say, I, I really. I, <laughs> yeah, you do, and I, I really appreciate your realism, and uh, you're very good at getting down to the bullet points of the like the uh, the what you're trying to you know help people understand or project. I'm I'm always impressed with your videos, and I, I watch every video you put up, and I've learned so much from it, and uh, it's really appreciated. But it looks like we're going to get to the audio break here, so uh, we won't be able to hear each other or talk for about three minutes. But I will catch you on the other side of the break, and we'll pick up with Nozima. We are TFR. My fate and destiny is all I need to prevail. Why would I want to buy one of these, uh, Mr. Radio Shack Manager? Why would you want to buy one? Because now everybody's a KO Corvette.
back to Comrades and Farms here on Truth Frequency Radio, iHeart, tuned in, talk stream live, and usually on the Pharmacy Seas Network YouTube channel, although we seem to be having some technical issues over there. Also, uh, this is broadcast, or not broadcast, but uh, posted as a podcast about a month behind the uh, live stream post. So uh, tonight's uh, guest is Ian Stepler from Canada. He's a commercial beekeeper. And uh, he's sharing some insight with us about uh, hive and bee management as well as disease management. So, Ian, welcome back to the show. Yes. Uh, thanks, Carl. Um, so, before the break there, uh, we started into talking a little bit about nosema, uh, something I'm not too awfully familiar with. Uh, I think I've learned a little bit more about mites than I have nosema. But I know you've had issues with that. I remember you were doing some uh, some microscope checks last year. I think it was in the wintertime and, and checking what the status was on infection levels. And uh, I know you did a video this fall talking about uh, the sunflower pollen and a study I think you had read on that uh, helping to reduce the nosema load. I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about that or your thoughts, insights, or perspectives on it. Yeah. <clears throat> so that. Uh... That's, this is could be a very long-winded little uh, thing here. Um, nosema has always been a plague to the honeybees, and for the longest time, uh, the nosema species was nosema aphis. Um, we we're kind of we we're able to kind of control that gut infection uh, with the treat, but there's a, sh- a shift in species to nosema serrana, and the, the Treatments don't seem to be as effective as they were with the apis, and they find that the surrounders is actually out competing the apis, um, and it completely, totally, um, it it affects the bees in a different way than the apis was. There's a lot more visible signs of apis than there was Serana. Serana is more of a silent uh, infection; you can't really see it. There's not much poop in front of the hives and such, but it's just as harmful and it's causing terrible grief for these hives and I, I blame Serana for a lot of problems we're seeing within the beekeeping industry just because it's it's silent, it's a silent killer we can't see it actually affecting the hives it's just the hives are just dragged down when you're poor so what the, the, that bacterial disease does in the bees is just drags down their health um, it just it provides an unfit bee. It doesn't allow the hive, the, the nurse bees, to properly adequately feed the young. Uh, it decreases the lifespan of the honeybee. And that compounded with other problems like mite or let's say you have some pesticide residues or other nutritional issues, it just, it, I think, is one of the main culprits of all of our troubles. But, so what, what I've been doing... Um, to uh, combat that disease is I've been focusing my efforts around uh, nutrition. <clears throat> and I figured, well, I can't do anything about that gut disease uh, through uh, treatments because the treatment's just so irregular and uh, ineffective. So my thoughts was, well, what I can do is I can make these, these as healthy as I can. And I, like a healthy animal can combat disease a lot more effectively. So I focused extremely hard on building nutrition up within my colonies. And it comes very natural to me because I'm a farmer or a grain farmer, so we're always try, trying to build up the soils. We're always, and we're cattle farmers. We're, you know, we're always supplementing our, our cattle with uh, uh, minerals and, and vitamins just to, you know, kind of fortify their diet to make them a healthier animal, better doing. So that's my focus with the bees. So over the years, I was, you know, trying to increase the health of my eyes by providing a supplement to my bees. And it's just, there's, you know, you, you can't replace that natural pollen. Um, we can su- supplement our hives all we want. But if we don't have that natural pollen, the hives, basically, they can't exist. There's a nutrient within the pollen that we, we, we don't know what it is. I call it the natural spirit, like nature's spirit. There's that factor X that we can't supplement. No matter how much time or energy or how much food we give them through the supplement, the bees can only get so far and they can't get past that. So as I'm supplementing my hives um, and trying to increase their nutrition, I'm recognizing that, okay, I'm I'm being able to provide that benefit for my bees, but I can't get them past a certain point. I can't, you know, in the prairies here, we're starting to lose diversity, so we're getting 
and loss. We're not getting access to much as much pollen for our hives. And, and you know, I'm trying to provide that nutrition through the supplement, but I can't just get that past that point. So I come to the realization that, you know, I can fortify their diet and everything and fill in the, you know, the blank, but I have to provide that factor X in a natural sense. So now I'm wandering down the path to complement that supplement that I'm putting in there to try to, to uh, provide more flowers out there to provide that factor X for my hives. Like, uh, Carlton, you got to realize, and the prairies here, we're losing... Um, but, you know, almost that natural aspect of the countryside. Like, we're grain, grain farmers, so we understand, like, it's not that I'm uh, saying that this is a wrong thing. It's just we're, we're farming in such a way that we're manipulating the landscape right now. And what's happening is we're losing that natural diversity, right? Uh, within our fields, we used to have terrible weed control. So we always had that influence of Mother Nature providing those weed flowers all through the countryside, all through the year. Um, we have bush all across the landscape, tree rows. That's all being pushed over and farmed. We're being able to manipulate the land where we can farm, like uh, run machinery over, which we couldn't before when we had to pasture. it. So, it, you know, the landscape is becoming more specific, and we're losing all that natural aspect of it. And we're losing those flowers. So my whole intention is to increase the highest nutrition to help fortify their health, and I'm losing that factor X, so I'm starting to grow it. So what I'm doing is I'm focusing around the ditches and bringing those flowers in the ditches I'm around the edges. I'm not interfering with what we're doing within the fields because that's dollars and cents. We can't interfere with what we're doing there. We've got a business to run. But, but around the edges, maybe I can have a little space. So around the field edges, we'll have some flowers. Um, we'll leave, like, natural ravines, which are not trying to farm it musk eggs and such. Our pastures will strike their own flowers within their pastures. Uh, just, you know, there's places where we can put flowers everywhere. And one of the projects that I've been doing is I'm growing these pollinator strips. Um, and what, it, in fact, it is, is just a big bag of flowers, and I throw it out, and I, I let it grow. And I find little places across the countryside, like within the farm, where, let's say, maybe it's a little bit wet, and we can access that one corner. So I'll go in there and I'll flow, sow some flowers. Or if we have a really good seeding year and I don't have those accesses to little pockets of wet spots, which I can seed the flowers to, I'll actually go over and just sow down a strip of flowers right down the side of one of my fields. It drives my brother crazy. He manages the grain for oh, <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't like to see that weedy. He calls them weeds, you know, they're flowers, they're bee food. <laughs> but what I'm doing is, you know, I don't have a lot of time and... Um, in the pastures and such, I grow clovers because it's extremely easy to grow clovers. And clover pollen is extremely beneficial, very highly nutritious, and tons of nectar. But it's a biannual. In these um, pollinator plots, I'm growing, I'm growing annuals because it's going to be farmed next year, right? So I got to grow a flower that gets into flowers quick, provides nutrition for my bees right away. So I'm growing uh, a few flowers. I, I throw some canola in there. Uh, like dinner and canola, I'll throw a phacelia, which is an amazing flower. This kind of flowers for like a month, month and a half. There's a beautiful little uh, color blind. My wife says they're purple, but uh, lots of highly nutritious pollen and lots of nectar. But uh, our farm's growing sunflowers. So I'll grab a leftover bag of sunflower seed in the corner of the shop and I'll throw it in the seed mix and I'll grow sunflowers along these strips. And what I'm doing is I'm, what I, I'm trying to target the point in time that within the year, which is the most critical for the hives, to be able to access that, you know, that uh, that nutrient, that missing nutrient, that that uh, factor X. And that point in time is after the main honey flow. After all those summer flowers goes into fall, we start losing all that access to the natural diversity which we normally have. So I'm trying to replace it with those flowers. So I'm. I'm I'm growing these pollinator strips and such. I'm, I'm growing a little bit later in the year, so they will, you know, come into bloom end of August into September, provide that natural, uh, uh, that, uh, the natural nutrient that I can't put into my supplement. So, you know, I have my, after the, my boxes are off, I'm feeding my hives up uh, with patties to try to fortify the nutrition to grow these nests and providing all that 
there's natural pollen out there they're accessing the clovers and everything, but I'm also growing it too. I'm providing that pollen during that point in time where there's where it's a little bit lacking in those pollinator strips. And what I found that you know, um, I'm growing these sunflowers, and I'm finding studies that are talking about the benefits of sunflower pollen, and something I wasn't aware of before. But it turns out that the sunflower pollen, there's something about it. Either it's the texture of the pollen, or it's the microbial uh, uh, environment that's on the sunflower pollen, or something. Maybe I'm some not sure what it is about the sunflower pollen. Yeah. But yeah, stuff like that, and it's it's uh, it's counteracting the negative uh, bacterial uh, infection within the bee's gut, and they're finding that bumblebees are specifically talking about bumblebees, and I'm not for sure I'm sure what kind of gut infection they're talking about. I don't remember offhand here, but they're finding that bumblebees are actually naturally medicating themselves on these sunflowers. They figure is to help counteract that bacterial disease within. In their guts, and I thought, I said, oh shit, that's extremely interesting. And, and so then I got looking through a few more studies, and they've actually done studies on honeybees, where this sunflower pollen actually provided benefit to the bee because it counteracted the nosema spores within their gut. And I was thinking to myself, that is extremely interesting because our farm, we haven't been growing sunflowers for too long. Like Dad used to grow up a long time ago, but we brought it back in. Sure, a rotation. We've been three years now, it's, or four years. The sunflower is in our rotation. They're scattered throughout our farm, and our neighbors are doing the same thing too. They're, uh, they're just adding it back in the rotation. So I have access to sunflowers right across the countryside. And whether or not this is coincidence or not, I'm not sure, but there is a correlation between the problems I was having with nosema in my honeybee guts to when we started growing sunflowers and the neighbors started growing sun, sunflowers around the area to where the nosema infection within my almost disappeared. And it's, it's, I'm not sure if I can make a correlation between that because there's lots of things that go on. There's cycles, disease cycles and everything. Um, one other thing that I stopped doing was I stopped using this treatment, which normally, uh, help with that nosema apis infection and I stopped using it because I found that that treatment was actually providing more uh, and instability like I was trying to do tests and I was seeing this huge variability of infection within my colonies after the treatment it, it bring the infection down but it was a huge rebound to come back up and it was just providing poor health for my colonies I figured so I quit using that and I quit using that treatment at both the same time that this sunflower started to, you know, come into my hives. So there might be a lot of things going on there, but everything just seems to be lining up right now to where my hives are in my shed right now, and I'm going through and I'm doing my tests, and I'm finding very low levels, very consistent low levels of nosema within my shed here, within my hives. So it just... It's very interesting to me, and I just think that maybe there might be some benefit that I'm seeing there from the sunflower pollen, and by adding it to my pollinator strips as I'm trying to fortify my my diet for these honeybees, you know, I, I can't provide all these other natural aspects. Why am I worried about trying to provide it within my patty? I provide my patty with the nutrition I can. All the rest, I provide naturally. As, um, so I just I just find that what I'm trying to do is improve the nutrition nutrition of my bees, um, but I find that I I have to complement that with a natural aspect, and that's by growing flowers. So we can't you know <laughs> as you can appreciate as a as a beekeeper we, we we can't get away from that natural aspect to raise our bees. We need that natural aspect. If we lose, we lose that natural aspect, our hives die. It's just as simple as that. So whatever we can do, do as beekeepers, we have to keep you know going to grab that natural aspect, reinstate it, or promote it, or establish it, or whatever we got to do. But we need it because without it, these bees die. So you know, that's kind of a rambling on about about what my project is around on uh, nutrition and the, how the sunflowers. But I find it very interesting.
Uh, no, that's that was a fantastic. I wouldn't call that a ramble. I'd say that was just right spot on. And that's one of the things I really have come to admire about you is is I know you're studying studying and mimicking the natural system as much as you can and integrating that. And uh, I think there's a lot of big scale farmers who aren't uh, paying attention to that model. And I think it's costing them economically, and I think it's costing their farm soil and their animal and their own health in the long run. And uh, you know, I came from a very conventional farming perspective. When I was younger, I worked with a farmer um, who I admired very much. And but we used, you know, we used uh, Roundup and we used, uh, you know, uh, fungicides and all this kind of stuff to try and manage things. And uh, and I wasn't even aware that there was another way to do things until more recently. And I came across uh, John Kempf and advancing eco agriculture, Gabe Brown, some of these other um, sort of paradigm shifting people. And uh, as I've kind of taken on some of their practices and, in, and incorporated them into my system, even though I'm a small homestead, it's kind of an experiment farm almost. I've learned a tremendous amount about it. And I've seen some really positive benefits and results from that. And actually, one of the things that I integrated this year was sunflowers. I, I planted a ton of sunflowers based on what you were saying about it even last year about how you put them in and how you were noticing a big difference. And you were talking about making sure that that nutrition was there for the fall so uh, it's really inspiring, and uh, it's really exciting to, uh, you know, to see to see that working for you. And yeah, you know, like you say, uh, you know, it's like you can't you can't say that you have, you can't say you figured it out for sure, right? But if you keep seeing the same results over the years, and you're still doing that with uh, with the sunflowers and the other pieces of that system you're integrating. You know, maybe maybe it will start to show statistical significance, but that's one of the things I really wanted to touch on briefly because I know you talk about this in your videos a lot, and I think it's a really important perspective for other farmers to pick up, and other people even with, uh, you know, in their backyards or whatever is that that thing about saving the ditches and those little wildflower pockets. Uh, it's easy to go buy one of those and not think it has any significance, but. I think you could probably speak to how much significance it actually has, even just for your honeybees, and that's about going into all the other insects that are affected by that, right? Yeah, it's and I mean it's something that uh, we don't appreciate until uh, you need it uh, to be able to sustain you know, the management around. Like I'm a farmer, a cattle farmer for a long time, and I've brought honeybees into the farm over the last 20 years, so this is something new to our farm. And I, I remember farming with that, and there's absolutely no consideration to, you know, these little wet pockets, these little wetlands, these waste, the waste areas in the countryside. It's just because we didn't understand the true value those are represented to the natural world, right? And I just, you know, I, I want to admit, be very careful that when I talk like this, I'm not hammering farmers because we're doing the same damn thing with our fields right, and right, farm right. square and they're very specific and it's you know it's business and the dollars and cents and I got yep. until I realized as a beekeeper is you know I gotta realize that farmers gotta do what he's gotta do but at the same time we need to establish a little bit of balance and that's something that the honey farm has kind of provided me is just provided you know open up those blinders a little bit and just kind of bring a little bit more perspective into the whole situation, you know, what is going on here. Like, if we want to manage our lands in a sustainable fashion, we have to consider everything that's around us. So we got business we got to take care of, so we got to look after that. But that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, that preserve pockets of that natural world that, you know, is a little bit tougher to farm, like ravines, uh, natural waterways. Uh, I'm looking at... Uh, we're right across the countryside through Canada and the United States. A mile grid up here is Queen's property. It's uh, you know it's only being used for road access and such. Maybe a little bit of hay, but there's opportunities all over the place, like along roadsides where we instead of just indiscriminately spraying and killing everything but the grass, why don't we get a little more creative? You know, if, if the society really gives a damn about you know sustainability and the health of the wild bee population and honeybees, and why don't we put a little more effort into maintaining this vast model landscape right across the countryside and develop these natural little ecosystems with, you know, food, you know, flowers. Flowers is food, right? And put a little more effort. It costs money, 
you know, it costs a little bit of time, but, you know, just a little bit of effort goes such a long ways. And if people really give a damn, then maybe they provide that little bit of effort just to be able to, you know, allow other things to live. And right across the countryside, you can do that within the ditches. Uh, these little wet spots, like I have, I always, I go back to this one bee yard all the time because it's just an ideal situation. I'm right in the middle of a section of field, nothing but field. But for some reason, uh, he's left this little corner and it's wet and a bit of a waterway that goes through it. I guess that's why he kind of left. He's got a patch on the other side, but it's a section field around me, this little wet spot. And that little wet spot flowers, a different flower, right from uh, thaw, right from spring. We have the uh, uh, poplar trees come up and the willow trees. And all the way through spring, the willow's flower provides pollen and nourishment for my bees. You get into spring, you get some of those, uh, the annual plants, the biannuals, the flowers all the way through spring, right into summer, we get the clovers, um, then you get into alfalfas, and then you get into the fall flowers. Um, I can't, I need to remind me of the flowers rod. right in there, but there's joe pie weed, yeah. there's goldenrod, there's the annual sunflower, there's asters, and all these flowers, pretty much that little pocket of land flowered consistently and steady right from the spring, right till freeze up in the fall, and it's provided nourishment for my bees to be able to sustain themselves on. Extremely important for not only bees, but every other pollinating insect out there relies on the pollen. And if you have little pockets like that all across the countryside, then all of a sudden you have that diverse uh, food source that allows things to live. It allows, yeah. you know, uh, uh, just it allows them act to that environment around us. And by allowing other things to live within the countryside, it'll directly benefit the farmer's field as we require so much on pollination. But not, it's not only pollination. It's also the that balance against Mother Nature. We have all these pests influencing your fields all the time. Well, Mother Nature is a balance to her, you know, to her pest problem by providing the beneficial insects to come in and take care of that problem, eh? but you need that harbor of the natural world sitting there waiting to pounce on that problem when it happens. Mother Nature will take care of it. Just we have to allow it to happen. And I just feel that <clears throat> we're, as I'm looking at the way agriculture is progressing and it's moving, and I understand it, it's, it's the way it's been going for the last 80 years. It's just I think we're, we're heading in a situation where we might have trouble backing out. Uh, and we just have to make sure that we have to acknowledge one of the hardest things for farmers to do, including ourselves, is recognize what we're doing as a problem. Like we're caught up in business, finances, we have tremendous pressure. We're almost going to pressure every bloody yeah. year because of the weather and all these influences. And our, our commodity prices, we're not getting paid enough. So we're focused on production, production, production. We're getting as much as we can out of that, that land. It's costing us a fortune to buy it. It's costing us a fortune to pay for it. We have to make sure we maintain our livelihoods. That's all there is. Bottom bottom line, that's what it's all. So there's that huge, huge pressure that kind of puts those blinders on. And as soon as someone tells you, hey, you know, consider something else, we get very defensive about it. And especially like our farm too. We, I mean, the old man's like yes, Roundup. We Roundup's made our farm profitable. He's absolutely right. If it wasn't for Roundup, we'd be broke right now because it's made with the technologies has helped us hinge on the technologies and has helped us you know, become a profitable farm again, control our weeds, bring in better crop yields and such. But at the same time, long-term effect, how is that affecting the soils? And that, how is that affecting the environment around us? And how is all this change in our farming practice uh, influencing the natural world around us? It's, you know, we have to consider that. If we can't consider that, we can't evolve and change either. So, and I think, I truly do think farmers... I, we are stewards of our land, and we do recognize this. We're always trying to achieve that. And I do recognize our farm, and I recognize farms around us. I mean, we're a 3,500-acre grain farm, and I'm talking about a 10,000-acre grain farm that way. So big farmers out there that are recognized. Another 15,000-acre farm over here, too. They're recognizing that maybe, maybe we have to focus a little bit more on soil health. And we have to acknowledge maybe what some of these chemical treatments are doing to our land and that microbial environment within the soils. 
And maybe we're just not allowing the soils to fortify itself to provide its function to be able to combat all of these diseases. And maybe if we provide a little bit more attention, this is a conversation from these big guys, maybe if we provide a better soil health to where the microbial environment can kind of maintain itself, maybe we won't need all these expensive chemicals to solve our problems all the time. You know, to kind of bring that cycle back. And, you know, use the chemicals if we have to, but just this continual use yeah. of chemical just to control these problems I think it's we're, we're tipping the balance on the wrong side so I think I think we're we can recognize that we pull ourselves back a little bit but we have to focus on the right things and that is providing that natural diversity and that the health within our soils and you know the natural aspect of our landscape is pretty much what I preach I completely agree with you and that brings us right up to the break uh, I know you said you could only stick around for an hour. If you want, you're welcome to stay on longer. But if you uh, if you want to jump out, that's fine too. Sure, I could stick around for another 20 minutes. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are T F R.
back to Conrad's and Farms here on Truth Frequency Radio. iHeart, tuned in and talk stream live, and also usually on the Pharmacy Seas Network. We'll be posting this back up on the Pharmacy Seas Network YouTube channel later on when we can get things straightened out. Tonight's guest is Ian Stepler, and we were talking about uh, managing bees and bee colonies. But we also were talking a little bit about our perspectives on how uh, how we affect the environment and how that uh, can have a positive or negative feedback to our own farms and uh, how we have to preserve ecology. Uh, Ian, before the break, you were talking about your perspective on that, and I, I really appreciate that, that, um, that you understand that from a farmer's perspective, uh, one, because I think a lot of people, you know, they look at farmers using things like Roundup and stuff like that, and they don't understand the incredible pressure that these people are under uh, to maintain the land and equipment and pay all those taxes and pay all those bills, you know, it's really hard to actually make a profit farming. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And so um, I'm, I'm glad that you made that clarification. I also try to come with that perspective about uh, not, um, not bashing our farmers, but just trying to open minds and get them to change their perspective a little bit and maybe even try little new things that and see how they work for for them on their farm. And then when they discover the benefits of that, I find that often opens their mind a lot more. I find that uh, that perspective of just trying to tell them what to do just closes them right off, like like I think it does anyone, you know. But, uh, the, um, presenting it in a way that, um, that gives them an opportunity to think about it instead of uh, just trying to force them to think the way that you think, which almost never works in my experience. Yeah, the last thing we want to do is to vilify uh, the farming community. Um, it's, we're being, we have fingers pointed at us all the time as being the problem. You know, you guys are doing this wrong. You're being told what to do. No one actually comes to us with any actual answers on how to manage these issues otherwise. I mean, it's the same with fossil, fossil fuels. If, if we're not going to use fossil fuels in our car, then provide us... You know, alternative. alternative. You know, we can't run combines on a battery-powered, solar-powered uh, machine. You know, if we're farmers are you know kings in innovation, and we're always looking at doing things better and how we can adapt and survive. It's probably because we have to deal with weather like this. Like, I'm just listening to 80 click winds outside the window right now. It's <laughs> snow blowing against the window. <laughs> yeah. How do you manage a livelihood in this type of weather? You know, it's just absolutely insane. So we have to be creative. We have to be able to survive, right? And it, and farming a business is no different. If the consumers want something, then we're going to give it to them, and we're going to get we're going to do whatever we have to to get it to get there. But they have to be able to compensate us with price. It all comes down to mighty dollar. If the consumer actually wants a certain direction or food produced a certain way, they have to use their biggest vote, which is their dollar, and you know. And we'll provide the guidance to the farms to do that. And if we were getting paid five dollars a bushel for wheat, we can't put all these extra efforts in adding our costs to be able to, you know, achieve what they want at five dollar wheat. They got to give us like seven dollar wheat if they want us to do all that. So they got to lead us a little bit better. And have to appreciate our efforts, and we have to compensate us for it. It's as simple as that. You know, if we want, to, if they want us to run solar power combines. That's going to be a lot of cost, a lot of change, and that you know that takes dollars, and we can't absorb stuff like that. You know, solar power combine. That's a terrible example, but you see what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, all these yeah. implied, all these imposed costs onto the farmers that we're being, you know, you. This is the way we want you to do it, but they're not providing us any compensation to build to take us in that route. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a, I'm just kind of airing a bit of frustration of the farmer saying, like, wait a minute, you know, but at the same time as the beekeeper, I'm like, yeah, but let's, you know, let's just put these little efforts in there that don't cost a damn difference, right? Just these little efforts around the edges where we can maybe claim to be able to provide that nutrition for, you know, my focus is on the honeybees, so, you know, provide that pollen to help my bees. Uh, uh, you know, become better nourished, improve their nutrition, and overall become uh, a more productive operation. And such. 
For sure, for sure. That's a big driver on why I started the show was to kind of, I, I learned a lot from Advancing Eco Agriculture, Bionutrient Food Association, and a lot of these other organizations that are educating farmers about how to use nutri uh, nutrition and building soil and foliar feeds and trying to steer away from chemicals and more in a natural system mindset about things. But I was realizing that consumers just don't have a clue about it. And I, you know, and I heard all sorts of people saying all sorts of things about, well, the farmer should just do this and should just do that. And it's like, man, you got to understand where they're coming from. And, and like you say, yeah, you know, you should be compensated for it. Like you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't take on a job, you know, for say a salary. Right. And then, and then all of a sudden the work gets doubled and expect to just make the same salary. Well, that's the same thing goes for a farm. And, and it's exponentially complicated on a farm between the equipment, the repairs, the taxes, the cost of seed, the cost of production, the fossil fuel inputs. There's a lot of pieces there that you got to manage and balance. You're basically like a large scale juggler in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, there's a lot of things to manage as we're, as we're trying to maintain this, and you know, there's so many so many dynamics happening all, all at once. One thing I, I noticed, this is totally off subject, but for some reason I'm thinking about this. But through this whole coronavirus issue. What we've found on our farm um, is an increase in price. Um, our shit price has dropped a little bit, but the cattle market's recovered. Now they're doing all right. Our grain markets are up. Honey market is doing absolutely spectacular. And I think it's kind of comes down to the honey market anyways, that the consumers are looking at the shelf and they're looking for something local. They want to support the local producer. We're finding that with the businesses in the area too, that people are sitting back here and they're recognizing there's tough times here. They're spending money at the local restaurant. They're closed right now, like they're completely shut down, but you know, people are going down there and they're buying tickets for like, uh, what do you call them? Oh, oh, like vouchers or whatever. Uh, vouchers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're going and they're dropping dollars on their desk just to help keep those guys going in the honey market, uh, guys are going to the store and they're buying my honey, and they're buying also the Beamade brand and honey. What we we pack in the Canadian brand, and they're going there buying that honey up, and they're choosing that over other stuff. And it just, I, I'm wondering if throughout all this, the consumers just had to sit back and say, yeah, there's something about supporting our local economy, and maybe they're focusing with their dollar like they should be at. Supporting local efforts, and that's what it's all about: is using that dollar to support what they want. If they want the local economy to survive, then they're going to spend money on that, right? If they want to eat local honey, they're going to go out there and they're going to look for it. And if that's what they want, if they want us to farm our lands without Roundup or GMO or all that complicated issue, then they're going to go out there and they're going to buy something not that product, and they're going to guide our decisions that way, right? If they want, uh, or they want to buy some beef that's raised in the third, then they're going to spend their money in that direction. And farmers will follow suit because that's where the dollar will lead them. So you know, everything naturally will progress itself through. You know, you know, everything. I always figure will relieve itself, but we got to understand this system that we built has been here. It's been going for 80 years or more and we're you know 80 years into it and they're telling us to change it next week just like that is no we can't do that it's gonna it, it might take a long time to change out of the system into something more uh sustainable or suitable that we find uh maybe it'll take 25 years who knows but we need to be able to recognize that and we need to be able to move towards the evolution and we need to be able to get compensated as we do that it's very important and and we'll get there. Eventually, we'll get there. Technology will solve our problems, but uh, and maybe I'll create some problems too. <laughs> Who knows? But you know, it's just constant flux, constant evolution as we move. Same with the honeybees. You know, we, we find these issues with disease, but we find you know solutions. And we just just kind of keep bringing things in and just keep reacting to the problems that occurs to us. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I like. I'm very glad that you mentioned that about uh, that. It takes time. It's like, especially when you're working, like as a farmer, you're kind of trying to integrate between 
you know, sort of artificially setting something on the land to make a yield from it, and also still trying to work within that natural system. And, and uh, you know, it's it's different than like you just want to go invest in some technology and you can like you know tell the producer to just turn it on and go. Right? It's like it, it takes time to turn. It's very much like a, like a battleship, I guess, in a way. Like it, it takes time to slow that momentum and make the turn and come back around and like get going in a new direction, right? And, you kind of have to throw your feelers out Absolutely. too, and learn how it's going to work on your farm too, right? Yeah, and I find the same thing with the honeybee business too. Like, but beekeepers like to pride ourselves as being, you know, the natural farmer. You know, we're good for the environment because we're honeybee producers, and honeybees are good, and all that kind of jazz. But at the same time, we're still farmers, and we're still managing animals like insects, and we're still, you know, managing these these insects to bring in revenue so we're you know we're, we're we're using these insects by bringing in the resource from the area around us and that area around us only provides so much resource so we have to manage our insects according like we've got to stock them according to the the area around us and if we put too many bugs in one place you know it causes a problem because there's not enough to go around and then you have disease and all these husbandry issues and all kind of stuff like this so we we as beekeepers are in exactly the same category as farmers as we're managing these bugs by extracting the, the resource around us on this land. And a very natural aspect of it, you know, a lot of it's completely out of work. Still harvesting the resource within the area, exactly what that farmer is doing on that land, harvesting that, that piece of property. You know, we can extract what we can out of the value of that soil. And as beekeepers are extracting the value within the area, what could provide for our bees. And if we manage it wrong, I mean, we're working against ourselves to a detriment because we're not only providing a disservice to ourselves because they don't bring as much resource in that we can't capitalize on income, but we're also, so, you know, uh, that overpopulation is stripping the landscape of resource, which is taking all the rest of the resource from everything else living in that area too, like all the other natural pollinators and the pollen and the nectar and all this kind of stuff. So we have to realize as we're progressing as beekeepers, we need to be very aware of that natural aspect. And we also have to provide so that our, our manager our bees so that we provide that diversity for everything else that's living too. So we're exactly in the same boat. One of the things that I maybe, I don't know if we should go down this route, Oh, do it. We're on Truth Frequency Radio. You can, say whatever, you can say whatever you want. We're on Truth Frequency Radio. We're not managed by anything. We, we don't have any rules here. So so take us down the rabbit hole, please. One of, the, <laughs> one of the things that gets me in trouble with beekeepers, because I speak very openly a lot of the time, and they're always against farmers. Like, farmers, damn you for using that chemical on your property. You know, you're hurting our bees, all this kind of stuff. And I bring that, that story right around back to the beekeeper and say listen they're using those products on their property for the exact same reason you as a beekeeper are using your products in your hives to control those pests within your hives you are like as a beekeeper we are using a product called amitraz which is a chemical which is extremely harmful for our bees we know that but it's extremely effective at killing our mites like the bees may be able to tolerate a certain dose of this amitraz get through that exposure but the mites can, it kills off the mites but that exposure to that chemical is negatively affecting the bee's health, it's binding I you know I'm just a farmer and I don't understand a lot of the stuff but that amitraz binds the detox systems within the, uh, the bee themselves so when they're exposed to other, other pollutants, other maybe farm chemicals or other natural toxins that come in these bees can't naturally detoxify these, these these agents effectively because we've provided a substance to them which isn't allowing them to do that, you know. So, you know, the question is, you know, we provide this treatment to the bees, which is pretty much used worldwide right now. We're using an on-label. In Canada, there isn't a lot of off-label use of amateurs, but I know there's a lot of beekeepers in the States that use off-label treatments in their hives. And they're using concentrations that make me think, like, holy crap, guys, That's we're using a 3.3% amortized within our product. I'm talking some guys down in California, hopping up to 8%, 8% just because they're not getting effectiveness because they, they, 
the mites are becoming tolerant, right? So they just keep up upping the dose. And then they're finding problems with pesticide exposure from the landscape around as farmers are doing their jobs. The pesticide exposure isn't any good for the bees, but it certainly isn't any good for the bees when the bees can't deal with it themselves anyway. So who is at fault here? Is it the farmer for providing or for using that product across the landscape and providing that exposure to the bee? Or is it the beekeeper for using the product within their hive that's negatively affecting their ability to be able to detoxify the substances that might be coming in off those farmers' fields? But, you know, and, and up in Canada here, we're, we're pretty heavily regulated. Um, we're using an advertiser it's called Apivar, so it's a, it's a product that's regulated. I, I know in the States, most of this product is off-label. It's just the way it is, the way it's done. But I know the EPA down in your country is starting to look at that very situation it's, and, you know, coming around saying, there's off-label use of the, of the chemical we use in these hives. These beekeepers are complaining about all this off-label use of pesticide used by farmers. I mean, beekeepers are just going to fall into that same damn category as those farmers are with their off-label use of their tank mixes and such like that. And the EPA is going to come in, I think that's what it's called, environmental. It's, it's whatever yeah. regulatory yeah. body that controls yeah. your pesticide use. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. Yeah. I think it's yeah. a EPA down there. Yeah. But they're going to come in and they're going to prevent the use of that amateurize, off-label amateurize to the beekeepers down there. They're not going to have any option to be able to manage their mites. We're going to have widespread losses of mites or honeybees down in the States, and it's going to be epic because all of a sudden mites are going to kill everybody. They have no options. So there's there's big trouble coming down the pipe. There's, there's problems or how we are managing our hives as beekeepers that we have to recognize ourselves if we want to be able to solve this problem. You know, I'm doing it too. I'm using this Apivar. I'm using Amitraz. It's not any good for my bees, but I have to use it because it's the only damn product we have available that really does work to kill these mites. But at the same time, I'm looking at other things too. Like, if we can't use this Apivar or Amitraz to kill off these mites to relieve that pest exposure in our hives, uh, what else can we use as well? I'm bringing in oxalic acid and which seems to be worse. Uh, there's other products like Hopguard or Formic gas or other things that we need to keep working at to be able to find better efficacy so we don't, don't have to rely on these heavy chemicals all the time. So, anyways, that's, you know, it's a constant balance. You, it, whether or not you're in grain farming or whether you're beekeeping, it's the same damn business. We're controlling the weather, we're controlling pests, we're, com com we're managing the resource around us, it's dollars and cents, it's a business. It's all the same thing. And we just have to recognize that as beekeepers, we are part of that agricultural uh, program, I guess you could say, or that family. Uh, but agriculture also has to realize, yeah, agriculture also has to realize that beekeepers are a part of it too, yeah. We're not that yeah. ugly stepsister where we have, yeah. you know, we have to be, we have to be recognized as, within agriculture, but as beekeepers, we have to recognize that we need to be part of that, too. I, yeah. I, I, <laughs> so, I think my anyways, smart that's just something I, I think my smart-ass answer to the beekeepers would be like, well, keep your bees on a leash, what do they do on my, on my farmland, you know? <laughs> just to be a wise-ass, but... <laughs> well, that's but what grain farmers say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all right. But uh, but those are all valid points, and, uh, you know, I haven't used the Apivar, and I actually even haven't even done any oxalic acid treatments here yet. And I was planning to this fall, but the budget and the weather and stuff just didn't work out. So, but like last year, I had three hives going into the winter, and I lost two over the winter. I think one of them starved out, and the other one may have, but I'm not sure. But I came out with one. Uh, I did a split. That was a fail. So then uh, I ended up capturing two additional swarms, and then a third one a little bit later in the spring. And I'm back to four now, but, um, you know, I'm kind of curious to see since i didn't get to treat what, what how they'll come out in the spring and it makes me wonder like uh, uh you know if, if my colonies continue to survive like they are i wonder if maybe there'll be some of the last standing colonies if this whole uh thing shifts about using the apivar yeah and you know something we need to realize uh, recognize as beekeepers is loss is completely natural to uh honeybees like it's the natural cycle 
the beehive uh, establishes itself, it grows, and then it ages and it dies. And that happens over two, three, and we hope to four years. And as beekeepers, we need to recognize that natural cycle of loss. And we need to recognize that we will experience loss, so we have to be able to manage loss. You know, we, we can't expect our bees to be like livestock, but we will stand there, you know, for 18 years and just, you know, survive. The bees don't do that. They, they live and they die, and they can continually, naturally, in the natural world, they continually rejuvenate or regenerate themselves. They just keep building new colonies, building up again, the replacement stock. As beekeepers, we look at that beehive, and we say, hey, that baby's going to be there next year, too, it's going to be there four years from now. That's not how it's going to be. It's, you know, it's going to produce for us this year. It's going to age, and it's going to naturally die off. So we have to be able to manage our apiaries, and this is some of my strategy within my, within my operation here, is we have to recognize that. We have to catch those colonies as they're on the down slide. We have to take them back to the front, drop a new queen in there, rejuvenate that colony, bring that youth back to that unit and bring it back into the outfit. So continually calling out old stock and continually building new stock at the front end. So it's just like a cycle we have to recognize. I see that with a lot of beekeepers. Most beekeepers do manage their hives in that aspect where they're, they're either, you know, I notice a lot of the, the uh, migratory beekeepers in the States, they'll take their bees down to Texas or someplace in Florida, and they'll split them all out, and they'll build up absolute brand new fresh bees and they'll move them up to California pollination and up into Montana and Dakotas for honey and they'll move them back down and split them right out again so they're, they have that annual refresh every year up here we're not so migratory we're more stationary I think we'll move within 10 or 20 miles but we're pretty much set in point But so we take those colonies and we overwinter them as old stock and come up the spring and then we build them up again and up here we just have to you know, my, my strategy is to focus on the healthy and the viable, you know, the productive ones. And anything that fails a little bit, you take it out and you rejuvenate that column and get it going again. So yeah. it's a, a natural loss, you know, natural loss we have to reckon. Yeah, I love I love your uh, perspective on that. Promoting the brilliance within the colonies, and uh, you know, <laughs> that's just it's just such a great way to say that and think about that. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, their bees are so dynamic. You know, they're they're not like you said. They're not like livestock. They're uh, they're super super productive. So if you can take advantage of that productivity, like it doesn't matter that like a colony ages and gets old. And also like that life cycle thing too. They're like what like uh, forty five days typically is a life cycle of a bee roughly. And so like, you know, it's easy to be stuck with that livestock perspective, and then you know. When you go into bees, that's a whole different animal. Literally, they're literally mini livestock, and on a mini scale, on pretty much everything they do, they're really amazing creatures. Yeah, and everything that we do within our colonies is like reflective exactly what's going on within the area around us. It's one of the the, the things that I like best about uh, raising or managing bees is it connects me so closely to the environment Amazing. around, like it tunes you right into what's going on, right? So what you're seeing from the colony is, has already happened three weeks ago in the area around us. So I'm always trying to read the environment around me and always trying to figure out what's going on so when I go down into my colonies, I can see what happened, right? And then with all that information around us, we can predict a little bit better what we're going to see down in our colonies. And then when we get really good at it, then we can start managing our bees by being able to predict what they're going to do with the with whatever is going on within the area around us, and what we you know anticipate what's going to go on around us. So actually, a beekeeper, it isn't actually our job isn't actually you know managing that nest. It's just managing the conditions around that nest, and just being able to predict what's going to go on to build to you know help that. Or, you know, we, we give ourselves a lot of credit as we help our bees. You know, we don't help them. We just kind of, I say, we just kind of guide them along, you know. <laughs> guide them on this path. You guide them on that. Uh, you know, just kind of manipulate them in set such a way that brings out the brilliance and the build yeah. tech. Yeah, and tap tap that resource, you know, exploit that brilliance and tap that resource and then make a shit, shit ton of money on it. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I really like doing that. That's one of the reasons why uh, 
whenever someone you know buys a beehive for the first time. I started with four beehives at a university. I bought four beehives, and then it's that connection. It's addictive. And that connection just kind of grabs hold of you. And once you start, once you get that connection, once they grab hold of you, they don't let go, and you, you're going to be a beekeeper for life, pretty much. So it's a lot of fun. And it's probably the same with you, too, Carl. Yeah, very much so. And we're just about on the break here. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know if you want to come back after the break again or not. But, yes, I experienced that, too. And it tuned me in so much more, even though I thought my perspective was very dialed in. So, for sure. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you want me for another stand. I'd love to. I could stay yes. for one more if you want it. Okay. That would be great. That would be great. <laughs> for sure, then. I'll stay for uh, another break. From the dawn of man, we have turned to nature to help attain balance within ourselves. But somewhere, we lost our way. Western culture is once again remembering the healing benefits of CBD, the non-psychoactive component of the hemp plant. That's why more and more people who use CBD report relief from inflammation and chronic pain, balanced blood sugar and cardiovascular system, relief from muscle tensions, tremors, migraines, headaches, anxiety, depression, and the list goes on. The big question is, where do you get it? Iolife is a 99% pure CBD oil made with all organic ingredients, and it's available to TFR listeners worldwide. If you use coupon code TFR at checkout, you'll get $5 towards your order. Head on over to IALife.com now. That's A-Y-A, life.com. So, you love talk radio. Then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. If you have hard water, the LimeScale not only leaves white spots, it clogs pipes and breaks down appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars in energy and wear. Eliminate LimeScale and other water issues like brown staining and bad odors with HydroCare water products available from Wave Home Solutions. Wave's affordable water systems don't use salts or chemicals. You'll love the way your water tastes, smells, and looks. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. He was the deputy director of MI6, MI6, Britain's most senior diplomat. He was knighted by the Queen and in charge of thousands of highly trained spies. 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 But he was also a member of the paedophile information exchange. He had 45 diaries full of sex fantasies with children. His friend was the private secretary of Margaret Thatcher. 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 He strangled a child and hit another with his car. He raped young boys and organized orgies with children for other politicians. The Enigma Channel, intelligent television for planet Earth. EnigmaTV.com. to Comrades in Farms here on Truth Frequency Radio, iHeart, tuned in and talk stream live and also usually on the Pharmacy Seeds Network YouTube channel. Tonight's guest is a very special guest, Ian Stepler. He's a commercial beekeeper out of Canada and uh, 
we've had an awesome discussion about um, managing bees and managing bee colonies and bee health and how that relates to the environment and the pressures on farmers and how all those pieces really relate together. And uh, Ian's been kind enough to stick around with us for a little bit of extra time tonight over what he uh, agreed to, so I'm very appreciative of that. So, uh, Ian, welcome back to Comrades and Farms. Yeah, uh, thanks, Carlton. Once you get me talking about bees, I guess it's, it's just like any other beekeeper, you have a hard time shutting up about talking about bees. <laughs> Boy, it sure is a hard topic to walk away from. Every time I open a bee discussion with another beekeeper, it's just like, I think it's going to be 10 minutes, and it's like three hours later, I'm like, okay, I'm late for something. I really got to go now. But <laughs> I, yeah, know, I actually I had to quit answering the phone. Yeah, and I actually had to quit answering the phone because that. Uh, with my YouTube channel, this uh, Canadian Beekeepers blog, like I have exposure at 50,000 subscribers. I have like 20,000 beekeepers uh, come to my doorstep pretty much to watch my video every morning. And I get a lot of attention that way. So I get people, and I'm pretty open where I am and all this kind of stuff. We are a farmer business. We sell cattle across the countryside. So we have our phone number there. And I get beekeepers calling me all the time. And I have to, you know, I, I can't answer the phone anymore because you get on the phone with the beekeeper and everybody's just so excited and you just talk an hour, hour and a half, you know, and I like talking about bees too, but I can't do that because I got a business and I got a family. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, there's, there's another life to live in. a little bit of evening too, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Yeah, I, I run into that too, especially like on the amateur radio side of things too. Like you get talking about a topic and before you know it, like two hours have gone by if it's something you're interested in and passionate about. <laughs> yeah, one interesting thing about uh, social media, there's a lot of bad things about social media, but one, one good thing about so social media is it, it helps connect people. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and with the uh, beekeeping world, I mean, we're very small industry. Now, there's not a lot of beekeepers around, even hobby types around. There's, it's, there's not many beekeepers out there. So it's hard to, you know, you go down to the coffee shop and the old man's down there with the neighbor talking about farming, and you can find that neighbor coffee shop right across the countryside. But you don't have that beekeeping. And what social media does is it kind of provides a coffee shop for us to kind of get together and talk about bees. And it's really interesting. And it just find it just helps bring our um, industry uh, that's you know so far apart together and by doing that I think we're better because we build stronger networks and bonds and we can you know uh, just like you're doing the coffee shop down in Miami and there you just you talk about all these little aspects about what you're doing we can do that with beekeepers now easily and it's helping us manage your bees a lot better I think for sure, for sure, yeah. It's uh, this uh, technology makes it so that the geographic diversity or distance that we have is not the same as the social uh, distance that we have from a you know from a collaborative effort perspective. And uh, I th I think that might be the thing that might help us pull out of our uh, ecological um, damage spin that we seem to be in here on this planet. Um, I know when I had uh, Tom Seward on the First Nations. Uh, He's from the First Nations, uh, the Kowakiwak tribe in uh, British Columbia. And, uh, you know, his, uh, his perspective on it is like, you know, this is our one rocket through space. If we screw this up, we don't have another rocket to jump onto. And, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of talk about going to Mars and conquering other planets. And all I can think in all of that is maybe we should figure out what we're doing on this one before we go screw another one up. <laughs> no kidding, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about, uh, I'm curious, like, uh, I don't know how many hives you have exactly right now, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your operation, just how many hives you have, how much honey you typically yield, that kind of stuff, because that is such a massive operation, it's hard to even fathom uh, until, you've, till, until you've gone to Ian's channel and seen it in video. It's uh, And even then, I doubt that does justice to it as to, like, in person, but it's quite an operation you have there, and you're... Uh, you're very, very good at managing those bees. I'm, I'm very impressed with your uh, attention to detail and, and the scale that you're on. Yeah, I appreciate the kind words uh, on that. Um, I would consider myself uh, not uh, a real big beekeeper. 
I can compare myself to commercial uh, operators in the area. I'm kind of middle of the pack, I guess. Uh, the average apiary size would likely be that 500, 800 hives up in Manitoba, or Western Canada, I guess. You get some beekeepers up. Uh, you know, it's pretty common to see 2,500 hive operations, 5,000 hive operations. Um, it requires a lot of manpower. There's a few ten or 15,000 hive uh, honey operations up here. Uh, but wow. uh, for me, it, you know, 1,500 hives is, keeps me pretty busy. Um, I hire uh, one beekeeper, and it's Carrie. So I've, I've trained her. She's from Miami here. Uh, I've trained her to be like my, uh, you know, manager yeah. of the farm. So I can, my number one. Yeah. So she, she does excellent. a lot of my brood work. She does all my queen work. You know, I can drop all these jobs on her that I don't have to do so that I can put myself in more of a management type uh, position, right? If I can, that's the hardest thing about beekeeping is, you know, passing on that workload on to somebody else. Like everything about our beekeeping operation is extremely specific to what we do. And typically beekeepers are perfectionists kind of like me and we're workaholics and we don't let, we don't like other people touching our bees or doing our job for us because they're not doing it right. You know, we all have our little knacks and we want it done in a specific way. So it's hard for a beekeeper to grow out of that to be able to allow people in to manage the workload. That took me a long time to be able to figure that out. I mean, boy, oh boy. But Finally, I got my work the right figured out and all my systems put together. The right people, I absolutely bring competent people in, people that know what they're doing. And, you know, you don't need, a lot of the jobs are throwing boxes, honey boxes, you know, running extractors. You don't need a lot of skill for that. So you can tap into the area for that, local area for school kids and such. But for jobs like managing brood, making queens, in managing men, you, you need to be able to bring somebody in and train it properly. So hopefully I can keep carry for uh, quite a while so just to help me maintain the business. I don't think we'll get any bigger than 1,500 hives. That seems to be our cap. So the systems that I've developed to be able to manage the workload by bringing people in uh, with the facility I have, I'm pretty much capped. I'm at capacity right now. But if I were trying to get bigger than that, I'd have to hire another carry to have to buy another truck you know, to build a bigger bee house, um, another extractor, more boxes, more bees, more staff, you know, everything just that's basically to do doubled cost, so. yeah. But, uh, yeah, I've doubled, yeah, doubled everything right up. And now that's the secret about uh, managing bees is just duplicis, duplicity, you know, duplicating all the, the jobs that you're doing. It's like you're, you're looking after 250 hives in a certain facility. But if you manage things in such a progressive way where you put all these little processes in, then if you want to manage, let's say, 200 guys, 400 guys, you just duplicate it. You just bring somebody else in, more boxes, you know, better. Machinery. You want 400 guys, you want 800 guys, well, you just duplicate that. You have to bring in maybe a little more manpower, power, more equipment, maybe streamline your Uh oh. Uh, okay, I think we got it back. You got me? Yes, 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 I do now. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Maybe. Skype's being glitchy. <laughs> no, I, I think the uh, the weather we're having here, here is knocking uh, me out uh, occasionally, so I'm, I'm probably going to have to go in about five minutes, uh, probably right. going to get knocked off again. But uh, any, anyways, before I step out, I, I just want to your program here. It's, it's been a lot of fun. I, I enjoy uh, talking bees and just kind of elaborating on all these ideas. And, and uh, the conversation has been uh, terrific. The, the delay between us is like five seconds, so that's very awkward. But, uh, you know, yeah. we're getting used to this kind of stuff now in our COVID environment. <laughs> we're, we're doing more things online, so we're getting used to these kind of little quirks. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, it uh, definitely sounds like your connection is still kind of awkward there. But uh, I did manage to hear what you said, and uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your kind words. I'm really glad I got to have you on. 
I'm really glad we got to have this discussion, and I hope this opens some people's minds and their perspectives a little bit, and uh, maybe they'll start trying to work with the natural systems a little bit more and uh, not take it as an assault. And hopefully maybe consumers will come around and help uh, back up our farmers uh, from from uh, from all perspectives, you know, from the financial perspective as well as the uh, supportive perspective. Um, but uh, is there anything else you want to say? I know uh, we plugged your show, and uh, I'll be definitely putting links on for that later on. But uh, is there anything else you want to tie up on the on the end of this? Yeah, no, just uh, Carlson and I had a lot of fun, and I uh, will keep in touch. Uh, I'm hardly making you out. I think the blizzard is so I'm going to step out right now. But thanks for having me on, and, uh, and uh, I'll see you around. Sounds good, Ian. Thank you very much. It was a great discussion. Have a great night and stay warm up there. All right, so there you go. That was Ian Stepler. What an awesome guest and perspective. And uh, I, uh, I knew this would be an excellent conversation. I'm very honored to have had Ian on as a, uh, as a guest. And, uh, uh, man, I just uh, hope you'll go check out his YouTube channel and, uh, and support his channel and uh, share it with other people because uh, I think Ian's got a perspective that most large-scale farmers haven't adopted yet and I think that that's going to prove to be really beneficial in the future for all of us on this little uh, rocket hurling through space as Mr. Tom Suman says um, anyway uh, I know I had talked with uh, Kylie Victoria about uh, coming back on at the end of the show so if Kylie wants to come back on maybe I'll give her a buzz and we'll uh, we'll put the ribbons on this for the last 15 minutes uh, so let me just see if I can uh, dig her out with Skype here and so I think I got Kylie on the line. You there, Kylie? Hey. hey. Yeah. Sorry. One sec. I'm not plugged into you properly. So. That's okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to give you someone down the line. You there, Kylie? There we go. Hey. Oh. Can you hear me? Yep. 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 I got a little bit of an echo. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Let me readjust I, my mic. I think the echo's you, gone. Okay, good. Yeah. So what did you think of that? That was an interesting perspective, huh? Yeah, you know, I was in and out doing some uh, some graphic stuff here, too. So <laughs> I wasn't there for the, the full conversation, but I definitely popped in and out. and um, Interesting, for sure. Yeah, nice to uh, nice to hear a perspective uh, uh, that that uh, really kind of seems to understand that study and mimic nature concept. I know that's something you and I have talked about pretty in depth. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, uh, very interesting guest. Um, very honored to have him on and uh, have him share his perspective with us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, we've got what fifteen minutes left you wanted to yeah. talk about some related topics or yeah or uh or you know we could go into food a little bit more i can't you and i were talking about something the other night and i can't remember what it was uh that i wanted to bring on <laughs> but uh whatever we can we can just talk about bees i mean uh <laughs> there's lots to say about bees probably <laughs> i uh uh, have you, uh, you? Did you say you have a neighbor that uh, is keeping bees? <laughs> no, that was a, a messed up story. So when I was um, when I was a young girl, I once upon a time rented a basement suite from my landlord at the time, and she was keeping bees in her house. Like she had the. Um, the whole backyard as her apiary you know, or whatever. Yeah. Apiary, yeah. Um, so the bees were also living in in their boxes and everything and producing what they needed to produce, honey and whatnot. But they were also coming in to her house through a little window and living in her, her bed. And um, they also gravitated to <laughs> the basement suite where she was trying to rent it out to me. And so... Um, me being in a very desperate situation, I said, well, hell yeah, okay, we'll just clean up some of this uh, this bee stuff going on here. So we scraped 
some poop off the walls and ceiling. And turns out that's edible. Not that I ate that, but she told me it was edible. Because, I don't know, you probably can fill me in more on yeah. that topic. Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess it would look like poop. Uh, it's called propolis, but it's actually uh, the pitch of uh, trees. Uh, I guess primarily pine trees, but I guess multiple species. And it's actually uh, it's actually really beneficial for human health. And it's the bees use that to seal inside the hive. They use that to seal as an antibacterial and antifungal compound. Is it kind of a yellow, amberish kind of color? Yeah. Smell, well, now that you're telling me. Sweet. I should have just left it all over. <laughs> I well, should have been one with the bees. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. You mentioned the, the bees coming in the house. Actually, uh, the family farm up in Delhi, uh, we used to go up and visit uh, pretty much every weekend and over the summers, actually had a huge honeybee hive in the wall behind the chimney. And there was one bedroom in the upstairs of that house where if you put your ear to the wall, you could hear them humming. And if you wrapped mm-hmm. in the wall, you would hear the whole hive like, Whoa! Like rev That's up. awesome. <laughs> and the, the ongoing joke was like, one of these mornings we're going to wake up and there's going to be a whole hive, you know, like a colony, like in the house. They would have like eaten through the wall, but they never ended up doing that. <laughs> well, did you ever feel like you wanted to bust through that wall and just see if there was honey in there? Or I mean, there must have been some sort of, there was a colonization to some extent, yeah. right? So that, there must yeah. have been. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That and yeah, I, I did always want to like take the take the wall apart, like you know, surgically kind of like remove pieces. It was plaster of Paris, so it would have been a really tricky job to do it on. But I did always yeah. want to take that apart and look inside and see how big that colony was. But I will say this: uh, the amount of bees that were coming in and out of that colony was absolutely phenomenal. And I look at like my beehives, even my my highest performing hive this year uh, was like swarm number two. And those guys were pulling some serious traffic at, like, good flow points in the season. And they mm-hmm. didn't touch the amount of traffic coming in and out of that hive that was in the house. Mm-hmm. So I got to wonder just how big that colony must have been. And I think the new owner of the property, I think they stripped it out when they redid the house. And I never got to hear about it or find out about it. But it, it does leave me really curious just how big it was. Well, you know, maybe if – maybe this is – um some foreshadowing for a future endeavor where you just let your bees grow in your walls and have mass production. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. It wouldn't be too hard to sugar feed them that way either. You could set, you could like build your walls set up so you could like pour a sugar feed right in and make it accessible to them. This is making like the the word bee house is taking to it. Bee house to a very level. different. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's fine. You know, you do you, right? I mean, like, we're setting the bar with the landlord who lives with bees, so, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Whatever I mean, works. That's that's what I've always hoped this show would do, is shift people's perspectives, and that would be a huge perspective shift, wouldn't it? You live right in the same house with the bees. Well, I think that, you know, with all um, insects that come into your house, and a lot of other things, too, as long as you have uh, a mutually beneficial relationship with them, it's not really that big of a deal. I mean, like, spiders will take out a lot of insects that can be harmful to humans as long as you let the spiders live. I mean, personally, I'll admit they really creep me out, but as long as they don't look at them, right? So it just goes to show there are a lot of things that you can have living in kind of a symbiosis in your house that's, uh, you know, it's interesting, and as long as it doesn't bother you too much... You know, just let that lovely pet raccoon come in and hang out in your bed. <laughs> just I, you know, I, I probably would draw the line at pet raccoons, but actually there is a farmer out in the Midwest, and she has, like, pet, I don't think they come in the house, but she has pet raccoons, and she comes out and feeds them every day and, like, hang out in your lap and all. <laughs> like That blows my yeah. mind because... I've, I've, my interactions with coons has not been quite as friendly. I know, uh, you know, they would get into fights with our cats, and, and then I think mm-hmm. I told you we used to hunt them when I was a kid. Uh, one of my yeah. dad's friends had an excellent uh, coon hound. That was a I, really interesting experience. But I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I actually, I love raccoons. Um, aside from the one asshole raccoon that grabbed my rabbit. Um, and we actually found it alive, so it survived the, the snatch attack. But when I was much older, I think it was like 18 or something, there were raccoons that were living in my garage, and 
um, sorry, it was a raccoon that was living in my garage and she had had babies. And because crazy me decided to start feeding this raccoon out of the palm of my hand because I had zero rabies awareness or any sort of <laughs> concern, um, I became friends with this raccoon. And then when she had babies, she took them all out on the day to like move out, go to the forest. Cause I was also very close to the forest where I grew up. So like, you know, nine raccoons, little baby raccoons came out with her and they were all like, coming past me sniffing me and the mom was okay with it it was kind of like a really magical experience to have this relationship with a raccoon although like in hindsight I look back at that and think wow I could be like I could have rabies at this point in my life but you know I don't well it's funny I, I had similar experiences with uh with foxes actually up behind uh, my parents house there were several fox dens and the kits and would come up you know, they would come up like within a couple of feet of us and like play and all. They just got comfortable with us. So, and same thing, you know, like, or even a house cat, like if they want to tear you apart, they could tear you apart, right? Like, it's just an illusion that, that that's not a reality. I mean, <laughs> you think about what a committed cat could do to you in, in seconds. It's like, yeah, it's a good thing they're, they're friendly. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, in Vancouver, the, the wildlife there is very, almost domesticated in a sense because they're so used to um, human interaction. And I remember even growing up, I think I was like, I don't know how old this would be, but possibly grade six or seven where we had a summer of the coyotes getting way too comfortable with humans. And they were just coming into the yards and, you know, snatching cats, snatching babies, literally no joke. And wow just being really over the top. I don't know what got into them that summer. Maybe there was some like pheromone release, but it was only one summer that they got crazy. And there was that, just that mesh of like the human natural world. That was just a little bit too much. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, it looks like we only got about a minute left here for, for the break. And, uh, I don't know what else to wrap up on, but that was an awesome conversation. I'm glad you came in at the end, and we uh, got to talk about the, the bee house thing. That's awesome. Yeah. It, <laughs> it reminded me of the bee, the, bee, uh, the bee colony that was in the place up in the Catskills there. I'd forgotten all about that uh, amongst all these uh, bee-related discussions. So I'm glad you uh, coaxed that out of the conversation as well. well. I'm glad to trigger your memory. Very good. Well, uh, thanks for coming on, and I uh, appreciate it. And uh, I'll close the show out, and then uh, probably catch up with you for a little bit. All right. Thanks for having me. Anytime. All right. Well, that's it. That's uh, Comrades in Farms. You can listen to Comrades in Farms here on Truth Frequency Radio, iHeart, Tuned In, Talk Stream Live, and also usually on the Farmers to Seas Network YouTube channel. Someday we'll get that back online, maybe. Um, that pretty much wraps it up for the night. Uh, thank you to all the listeners who came over. Thank you especially to Ian Stepler for coming on as a guest. What an excellent guest and some wonderful perspective on bees and natural systems. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll catch you guys next week. And uh, we have another special guest lined up for next week, although I will not be here for the live. Hope you all have a great week, a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. Thank <laughs> you.